Well, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to another episode of Sussex Wildlife Trust TV. As you can tell, I'm not Michael Blenko. He can't be with us this evening. Um, I'm Charlotte and I'm the Wild Call Officer at Sussex Wildlife Trust. And uh, normally I pop on for an episode of the Nature Table Live, but this evening it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's talk uh, by James Duncan, who's hopefully still there. Hello, James. I'm still here, Charlotte. Hello. I'm still here. Hooray, <laughs> found the button. <laughs> Hi, James. Hi, uh, how um, are you? I'm all right. I'm actually quite, I'm quite excited about this talk because this is a subject um, that's always so popular, always getting loads of wild call inquiries on this subject, strange goings on in people's gardens. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to so sort of sitting back and relaxing and listening to you to all the hard work. <laughs> it could be a nice change. Um, <laughs> So just to say this, this talk was originally organised um, by our Eastbourne local group. So just to say thank you very much to um, Janet Knott. Hello, Janet. Um, and thank you to the Eastbourne group for organising this and for allowing us to open it up to a wider audience. Um, thank you very much for your, for your support. Um, so we have got a really good audience here this evening. So we've got at least 539 people logged in. Big um, um, so I won't take up too much time. Um, it's the usual format. James, you're going to speak for about an hour this evening. Um, I so yeah. yeah. See how it goes. It's a bit of a <laughs> bit of a bumper edition tonight. So <laughs> so uh, it, it, um, well, well worth it. So James will chat for an hour. Um, then we'll have a Q and A um, afterwards. So we'll try and get through some questions depending on how much time we've got left. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see that little Q&A icon. So you can type your questions there. Um, if anything comes up while James is talking, I'll keep an eye on those. We'll have a list of questions and we'll get to them um, at the end of the talk and answer as many as we can between us. So yeah, I think that's all the housekeeping. So I'll hand over to James and the hidden world in your garden. Absolutely. Thank you, Charlotte. We'll see you in a bit. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me tonight uh, to a presentation about the hidden world within your garden. Uh, so tonight we're going to be covering some of the uh, some of the some of the creatures that you can see on your screen here. Now, the uh, the eagle eyed among you uh, might notice there's a zebra there. Uh, I can tell you there's definitely not going to be a zebra in your garden, but there might be an animal uh, that has zebra in its name. So if any of those of you who uh, don't know me or do know me, uh, I'm James Duncan. I'm an engagement officer uh, with Sussex Wildlife Trust. Uh, I have been for the last few years. I've always been a very, very passionate naturalist. And uh, you may have seen some of my previous talks uh, that I've been doing over winter, uh, along with my colleagues. I did one on thrushes uh, back in December, repeated it in January. Uh, one on winter birds, which I did in December, repeated in January. Uh, and I even crossed the Sahara a couple of times. Uh, not this year, obviously, because um, none of us really have uh, left our back gardens, but that's the great thing about this presentation. But I did cross the Sahara as well. Uh, so hopefully some of you were able to join me for that. Now, I should say, folks, before we go directly into your back garden, uh, I just want to sort of say that, you know, across the planet, obviously, there are a huge number uh, of different environments that house millions and millions of different animal species. Now, obviously, this is not going to be news to any of you. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. Uh, but, you know, these kind of species, they can be found across all sorts of uh, world habitats, all manner of habitats. And these might be, uh, you know, dry savanna grassland or jungle and tropical rainforest to desert regions, uh, you know, to deciduous seasonal woodland, um, you know, to, to tundra, uh, to marine ecosystems, coral reefs and, you know, evergreen uh, coniferous forests of the taiga, polar regions, there's so many different habitats. But the question I really want to ask you all is, you know, do you need to go this far? Uh, well, you can't, obviously, none of us could, you know, none of us are allowed to go anywhere. Um, but I suppose, you know, when you think about it, can you see incredible species and amazing behaviour right here on your doorstep? Of course you can, of course you can, folks, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this presentation. Um, and it's probably important to realise that, you know, gardens represent a really huge UK habitat. And actually their overall area, it actually exceeds all of Britain's nature reserves uh, pulled together, which is quite an incredible statistic. Now, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter the size of your garden, uh, you know, your garden is always going to be the, the most easy location to observe all the kind of subtle complexities of nature. You know, it gives you this great insight into all the seasons as well, you know, you get to see your garden changing throughout the year. Um, and sometimes it might seem quite sanitised and quite a sort of, you know, genteel version uh, of what we consider the wild to be. 
But actually, that's not really true because it really is an alien world. You know, your garden is very much a microcosm of the wider environment. You know, it's full of conflict and, you know, fantastic ingenuity and incredible tactics uh, and violence, a lot of violence. You know, there's no doubt, everybody, nature, of course, is very violent. Uh, so there will be a lot of violence going on in your garden. Now, you know, the world within the garden, it's really like a safari park in miniature. You know, you've got some really, really precious wildlife in your garden. Um, ultimately, you know, all the protagonists are, are a lot smaller, uh, but of course the drama is no less real. So I would say, folks, is don your safari suit, uh, as I have here, be like David Attenborough uh, and get out into your garden and see what you can find, because it really is a fascinating place. Now, across the planet, Oh, no, sorry, I've jumped ahead of myself, actually. So just to say, I'm going to do a little bit of a seasonal tour for you tonight, folks. So actually, what we're going to do is we're going to have a little look at winter in the garden. Uh, we're going to have a look at spring in the garden. And I was also, obviously, going to cover summer and autumn as well. Uh, but what happened, everybody, was I realised that this talk was going to go on until round about next week, uh, if I'd done all the seasons. Uh, so what I have done is we're cutting those two seasons out. And we're just going to look at winter and spring tonight, just to keep things a little bit quicker. Now, in winter, uh, just to give you a bit of a roundup, um, you know, as we sort of draw to the end of the years in winter, you know, it can seem very quiet in the garden, you know, particularly if the garden is covered uh, in a layer of frost and snow. Now, it might seem that nature is kind of a bit suspended, that there's not really much going on. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of activity, you know, in the soil, the grass, in the leaf litter, for example. You know, we would expect to get the kind of worst of the, uh, the season's weather at this time of the year, you know, sort of at the end of the winter. Uh, but as it loosens its grip, you know, birdsong is really kind of increasing. Uh, so you might have noticed, folks, if you've been going out early in the morning at the moment, uh, you know, there's a real crescendo, but there's a lot of battle going on. It really feels like a battleground out there. Now, of course, early flowers are blooming. You know, you'd be seeing snowdrops and primrose and crocus and maybe even some early lesser celandine. You know, this might bring out the odd buff-tailed bumblebee, uh, possibly even an early bumblebee queen, and they'll be looking for any available nectar source they can. Now, although some of the ponds, you know, some of the water bodies have obviously been iced over, uh, particularly, you know, over last week when we had that real cold snap, uh, it actually won't stop a lot of amphibians from making a move towards their breeding waters. OK, everybody. Well, now we're going to do a little spotlight on birds. We're just going to look at a, a look at some birds in winter. Now, it's quite obvious that some of the most noticeable wildlife uh, and winter activity uh, relates to that of the birds. So, you know, you're likely to have a lot of finches on your feeders, goldfinches and green finches, you know, house sparrows as well, uh, maybe even siskins if you're lucky. But what I would say, folks, is you really should pay really close attention, you know, to the intricacies of this kind of garden hierarchy of birds. So actually, if we look at the kind of hierarchy of, of small perching birds or, or passerines, then actually the house sparrow is pretty dominant. So you can see there, uh, these, these are actually the weights of the birds, the average weights of the birds on the right hand side. It's not how much they're necessarily eating per day. So the house sparrow is kind of top of the hierarchy. The greenfinch is pretty high as well. You know, it's also a big bird, similar in size to the, uh, to the house sparrow, or certainly big for a passerine. Uh, the nuthatch with that huge beak is also quite high on the hierarchy. I'm sure none of you will be surprised to see the robin quite high up there, vigorously defending its patch. Uh, the goldfinch actually uh, is also quite high. Same sort of spacing as the great tit. Often you'll see sort of goldfinches and great tits uh, sort of feeding together. The dunnock is getting lower. The dunnock does tend to uh, fall foul of some of, the, uh, some of the birds above it in the hierarchy. The chaffinch is also quite low, uh, feeding on the ground beneath the feeders. And then the smaller tits, the blue tits and the coal tits are right at the bottom of the hierarchy. Now, I should say this hierarchy, although there is a kind of species dependence on where the birds stand, it also exists amongst species. So it exists within individuals. So you might find, for example, that one blue tit is very much kind of dominant over the other blue tits uh, within your garden. And actually, it may even rob food from them. Um, now, this might all seem a little bit harmless to us, but actually this, you know, it determines the whole reality of life and death. Uh, for these birds in the garden. It's absolutely critical. Um, and I really do recommend watching it very, very closely because it is fascinating. Okay, folks, now 
if, for example, you happen to have a great spotted woodpecker in the garden or a jackdaw or ring neck parakeets uh, that visit your garden, depending where you live, undoubtedly these birds are going to be dominant uh, in the hierarchy that I've just showed you. Now, where would you need to go to see incredibly kind of aggressive territorial behaviour? Well, in the Pacific or the subantarctic islands, you could perhaps uh, witness elephant seals or you could witness very territorial black rhinos on the African savanna, uh, you know, brown bears across uh, North America and across, uh, uh, across Russia, maybe even the Tasmanian devil. These are all very, very territorial animals. But we actually have our own territorial little thug in the garden, and it is, of course, the robin. Uh, and the robin is probably even more territorial and even more aggressive than all of those. So the robin, of course, is very much a national treasure. You know, it has this attractive, jovial appeal. Uh, obviously, it's our iconic sort of Christmas bird as well. Uh, and it has often this kind of rather plump sort of endearing appearance. And that's actually to do with insulation. So this is where the robin is trapping air uh, between the body and the feathers in order to keep itself warm. Now, of course, they often follow us around. Uh, their evolutionary history is actually as a forest bird. Uh, so traditionally, they would have been following deer and wild boar around, uh, you know, picking off the invertebrates that were being dug up. Now, often you'll see them bobbing up and down in the garden. And actually, this is very similar uh, to uh, the way that, you know, you, you crane your neck and, you know, you, when you're looking for the nearest pub, it's the same kind of scenario. This is what robins are doing and they're doing it to gauge distance. Now, of course, they sing religiously across the seasons in territorial defiance. Uh, and actually their eyes are very well adapted to shade. So they're often singing in the hours of darkness. This, of course, has often, you know, led to them being kind of confused for nightingale singing. Uh, over the ages, but you know, the robin is a much more subdued singer than the nightingale. The nightingale is uh, much more, oh, I can't think of the word, and the robin's much more subdued in its song style anyhow. But you know, how well do we really know our robins folks? That's the question I want to ask you. To be honest, the robin really is the bouncer of the garden. So the robin really will expel both other robins, but also other species of birds as well. You know, they're really, really highly strung, frequently fighting. Uh, but they don't really want to get to that stage. Ideally, they want to use their song uh, to keep their rivals at bay. So what they're essentially doing is they're involved in a verbal slanging match. They're just, they're just abusing each other verbally. The song might sound great to us, but in reality, uh, it's not quite so polite. Now, I've actually had to censor this Robin on the right-hand side because he is a particularly rude individual. Now, generally, the properties of the song will help to resolve conflict uh, sort of painlessly without it having to lead to fighting. But if the robins are quite well matched, then essentially what they have to do is flaunt their breasts uh, to try and sort of, uh, you know, create dominance. And actually flaunting those, uh, those breast colours, the, the orange with which we're so familiar, is actually very much a finger up gesture, to be honest with you. Now, if that doesn't work, uh, the only options really are either retreat or, to be honest with you, it's all out war, folks. So it's kind of more like this, you know, they yeah, potentially it, it could be fatal. You know, you could ask the question, who killed Cock Robin? Well, it's usually another Robin, to be honest with you. So uh, yeah, real thug, real thug of the garden, Robin. And the wren as well, actually, the wren is another bird that it doesn't really like to be with other wrens uh, outside of the breeding season. So generally it prefers to be on its own. Having said that, when it gets really cold in winter, uh, the wrens actually, they. They, they submit a little bit and they actually prefer a little bit of company. Uh, and in fact, it's not unusual to find around about six wrens uh, squeezed into a nest box, uh, you know, getting some winter warmth. Unbelievably, everybody, uh, over 60 wrens have been found together in the same nest box, uh, all piled on top of each other with their tails sticking outwards. I mean, that is just absolutely ridiculous. OK, so on to something completely different. I know Charlotte will like this. Uh, the brown rat, gotta love a rat, gotta love a rat. Well, I mean, you know, you have to, don't you? You have to. And, you know, besides humans, brown rats and house mice, you know, they are the two most numerous mammals on earth. Now, rats, they're incredible acrobats. Uh, you know, they really can survive extremes of temperature and permanent snow. And, you know, winter has very little effect on them. It really does very little to halt their reproduction. Now, they really are very adaptable. They can eat almost anything. They're true omnivores. But having said that, they're not indiscriminate. Uh, so actually, well, I mean, they've been poisoned, you know, we've poisoned them a lot, so they can't afford to be completely indiscriminate. And actually, they have something called neophobia, uh, which is where they're very suspicious about eating certain things. 
Uh, and actually, this is like children. Children actually uh, seem to have neophobia as well. But I would imagine that the neophobia of children is probably not created from poisoning, but you know, I would imagine so anyway. Uh, so, you know, suspicion equals survival in the case of the brown rat. Uh, curiosity killed the, well, rat actually, possibly. So they do have to be very careful. Um, but rats are very clever. So actually they can smell new foods upon the breath of other rats. And if they pass a sickly rat, uh, then often they, they, they can very easily work out what it is that rat's been eating uh, in order to make it sick. Uh, in fact, they're so smart that generally they instinctively know what food it is that has caused them a problem, um, even if they've been eating all sorts of different foods. Quite incredible. Now, of course, rats, uh, they are one of the most prolific mammals in terms of their reproduction. I'm sure that's not something I need to tell any of you. Uh, you know, a young female rat, she'll typically reach sexual maturity in just a few months. Uh, and after a few months, if conditions are good and there's lots of food available, she can give birth just a few weeks later. Now, litters generally, they're up to around about 10. Uh, and of course, these kind of this litter of, of new rats, they can be sexually mature in just a couple of months. So breeding is very, very quick. Now, once a female is actually given birth, she can mate again within about 18 hours of giving birth. Uh, conceiving while she's still suckling the previous brood. Now, the result of this, it means that in an ideal world, a rat actually could produce up to theoretically about 13 litters in a year. So bear in mind, folks, this is potentially the offspring of just a single rat, not even to taking into account all of these rats, which will also become sexually mature and be able to breed in just a few months. Quite incredible. Absolutely incredible. Okay, everybody. So if you wanted to see a fantastic ambush predator, a real hunter of par excellence, then potentially you could see polar bears in the Arctic. You know, you could go to Africa to see cheetahs hunting on the savannah. Uh, you know, you could look for crocodiles, uh, Nile crocodiles in Africa and saltwater crocodiles in Australia uh, and possibly even tigers across Asia as well. These are all fantastic hunters. But obviously we can't go and see any of these at the moment. But fortunately, we have an amazing ambush predator in our gardens. And that is, of course, the sparrowhawk. What an amazing bird this is. I absolutely love the sparrowhawk. Who doesn't love a sparrowhawk, to be honest with you? Now, the sparrowhawk is typically a shy hunting bird of mixed woodland, but it is without a doubt the most common raptor species within human habitats. So we've got about 35,000 pairs in the UK in total. Now, it really is an urban assassin of garden birds. There's no doubt about that. And they're very clever because they actually delay their breeding until mid spring. And this kind of coincides with the, the sort of suicidal incompetence of, uh, you know, fledgling passerines, to be honest with you. Now, their abilities in flight are mighty. They're phenomenal, folks. Absolutely phenomenal. You know, they very much rely on the element of surprise. You know, they weave through obstacles. You know, they always stick very close to cover. You may well witness one uh, weaving through your washing line, for example. Now, I actually saw a sparrowhawk just a few weeks ago. Uh, that dive through the slats on a gatepost, which I thought was absolutely incredible. I loved it. Uh, often it strikes prey before the prey has even seen it coming. Now, it's very important to say that, you know, uh, the numbers of the prey species, the birds that the sparrowhawks feed on, regulate the sparrowhawk numbers. So sparrowhawks, uh, you know, they don't regulate the prey species. OK, so they it's, it's what's known as a sustainable surplus. Now, of course, they are a controversial bird. And, and the main reason for that is they bring this predator prey relationship right into our living rooms. So, of course, normally we're, we're very familiar with seeing, you know, the predator prey relationships, you know, on, on kind of BBC documentaries. Uh, but you don't generally see it right outside your patio door. So it can be quite distressing. Anyway, uh, here's a little video that I just took in my garden uh, just just a few weeks back. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't take a video of a hunting sparrowhawk for you, everybody. Uh, because my videography skills haven't actually uh, they haven't progressed to quite that level yet uh, but it was just fantastic to see this uh, this juvenile sparrowhawk just perched on the end of the fence just a magnificent bird and look at those talons as well absolutely incredible now i should say everybody that any day that i see a sparrowhawk is a, is a good day for me i just i cannot get enough of them i absolutely love seeing them they're just brilliant absolutely brilliant so there you go little sparrowhawk video okay folks so we're going to talk a little bit about hibernation uh, and of course, a lot of us are very sensibly holed up in winter, uh, you know, just trying to get through the, the kind of short, cold days. But it is possible that we sort of overestimate the importance of, of genuine hibernation amongst all the animals in the garden. So, you know, it does kind of seem very logical that all sorts of different creatures are going to be tugged up snake snugly, you know, sort of waiting out the winter. 
But, you know, in the strictest sense of the term hibernation, this is not really the case. So it's only really hedgehogs and bats that truly hibernate. Uh, fantastic things they are as well. Um, but it's important to kind of realize that, you know, they undertake a very sort of profound change in, in the body's metabolism. You know, the temperature of their body drops to really, really low levels. Uh, you know, they, they might undergo sort of extensive periods of time between bouts of breathing, even up to an hour in some cases. Uh, you know, bats, of course, when they're in flight uh, and they're, they're chasing prey, you know, their little hearts might be beating a thousand times a minute. Uh, but it's only around about 25 beats a minute in hibernation. So it's much, much lower. Now, lots of our uh, sort of overwintering animals, garden animals, you know, they're, they're in just a sort of a sleepy state known as torpor, where they can be kind of woken relatively easily. Uh, but these uh, these animals, the hedgehog and the bats, uh, you know, they're in a state that far exceeds this. So they've undergone, you know, significant kind of chemical changes within the body. Now, that, of course, does mean it's not that easy to wake them up. Uh, it makes them quite vulnerable to predators, but it, it, it requires an awful lot of energy expansion if, if they do wake up. So it's very, very detrimental for them. OK, everybody, so let's move on a little bit to mammal mating. Well, when I say uh, mammal mating, I, some mammals, they're, they're, they're more active during winter. Uh, and when I say active, what I mean is, I mean, yeah, they're mating. I mean, basically, that, that's it. So squirrels are very, very active in winter, and their courtship can be very, very noisy. It can be very conspicuous. Uh, so males, often, they'll try and sort of entice females with a bit of flirtatious tail wafting. Uh, and they might even do a bit of paw slapping uh, on the odd tree trunk. So that's certainly something to look out for as well. Now, persistence with squirrels generally does pay off. Uh, and they'll often be, you know, you'll see them chasing each other around up and down trees, along branches. It's really, you know, it's very excitable. It's fun to watch. Uh, of course, it can involve a number of squirrels, not just one male and one female. And this can go on for hours, sometimes even days, which is uh, quite, quite remarkable, to be honest with you. Now, eventually a female who's no doubt probably quite, probably quite annoyed, to be honest with you, but also absolutely exhausted. Uh, she might just give in to, to, the, to the lucky male. And there's a little nod to Valentine's Day. Here is the lucky male. You see, he's got his roses and he's, he's, he's won. He's won the attentions of the female. So good on him. And of course, foxes as well. You know, winter is a very busy time for foxes. Uh, beautiful things that they are. Now, of course, they have a very wide diet. It makes them a very adaptable species. They're very well equipped to survive the cold. And of course, you'll often hear the dog fox, the male fox, uh, sort of barking loudly on winter nights. Uh, I suppose you could call it a sort of serenade, but I, I think most people probably wouldn't, wouldn't term it that. Uh, and I, I will play that for you in a little while as well, folks. Now, if, uh, you know, if, a, if a dog fox uh, sort of successfully, uh, you know, propositions a, a vixen, then uh, they'll typically hunt together for a few days prior to her entering estrus. Uh, and there really is a race for fertilization because actually this may only happen for three days a year, quite incredibly. Uh, mating is very noisy and uh, definitely very disturbing. Uh, again, that's something that I'll play for you very shortly. Now, you may also see this, everybody. If you see this, don't be too alarmed. I mean, you probably should be alarmed, but don't be too alarmed. Uh, and um, the reason this happens is, well, there's not really a simple way to put it. It's because the male gets stuck. He basically gets stuck. Um, and this may last for, uh, for up to an hour. Uh, so if you do see this, then this is basically what's happened and you probably should retain uh, an element of sympathy for, uh, for both foxes. Right, uh, what grey squirrel hospitality, grey squirrel hospitality through winter. Well, you know, grey squirrels, they're not actually that territorial. Though there's a lot of squabbling, uh, squabbling sorry, there's a lot of bickering, uh, you know, there can be a lot of tension, but generally they're not that territorial. But you would think that they still wouldn't really want to tolerate other house nests, uh, house guests in their dray. So you've got a dray here in the picture on the right. But actually, uh, squirrels do tend to invite other squirrels uh, to overnight with them in their drays. So bizarrely, squirrel dormitories are, are actually quite common. But there is one very important consideration, and that is no strangers. Now, the reason I say that is because even uh, competing males, quite incredibly, will sleep in the drays of the males they're competing with. So, you know, it, it's almost no holds barred. Uh, as long as the squirrels know each other of sorts, even if they don't like them, uh, they can still stay together. So there we go. So that's that's quite interesting uh, behaviour there. So to something completely different, folks, on to earthworms now. Earthworms are just absolutely fantastic, just incredible. Uh, and just to tell you a few bits and pieces about them. So. Earthworms have most of their vital organs close to the head. 
So actually, if they are cut between the tail and the saddle, uh, that's usually quite devastating for them. They've got a very, very tiny brain, uh, but they have been shown to kind of make basic decision making skills. They've got these five pairs of pseudo hearts and they also have a crop and a gizzard uh, and they might even swallow stones to help digest their food. And this is, of course, in common uh, with a lot of other animals and birds as well. Uh, so worms can breathe in oxygenated water because essentially they breathe through their skin. Uh, and amazingly, they're very long lived. So, you know, worms generally can't breed until they're a couple of years old, but they might even live to more than a decade, which seems absolutely incredible. Now, they really are ecosystem engineers. They are so, so vital. You know, they create water stable aggregates. They're really, really good at clumping the soil together, uh, which is absolutely critical because, of course, it prevents our surface soil, uh, our topsoils being washed away. Now, of course, they're incredibly good at nutrient recycling. You know, they reduce a carbon and nitrogen ratio within organic matter. They create lots and lots of natural fertilizer in their casts. Uh, they assist with kind of soil drainage, which is absolutely critical, uh, you know, for flood prevention. Uh, and of course, they're a fantastic burial service for getting rid of decomposing matter. Uh, they're just absolutely phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Now, of course, it's not just us that they're essential to. They're also essential to a whole load of animals. For example, badgers absolutely love them. In fact, a lot of uh, badgers in kind of Western countries, a huge proportion of their diet uh, is taken up by earthworms. Uh, hedgehog, I'm about to call that a squirrel, sorry. <laughs> uh, hedgehogs, of course, love earthworms as well. Moles are, are prolific uh, eaters of earthworms. Even tawny owls absolutely love them. Foxes, of course, will eat them. Shrews viciously rip them apart. It's absolutely terrible. Uh, buzzards uh, can often be seen feasting on earthworms quite incredibly. Frogs will eat them. Toads will eat them. Song thrushes love them. Blackbirds are often seen pulling them out of the garden. Robins will eat them. Newts will eat them. And even snails will eat earthworms. I mean, that must be the slowest, I mean, the slowest meal in history, I would imagine, but quite phenomenal nonetheless. Now, of course, it's not just the early birds uh, that catch the worm. As you can see here, a field fair having a bit of a tug of war. But birds often have to be quite smart when they're looking for earthworms. They'll often be looking for the worm's posterior, poking out of the ground. Now, you often might witness thrush species cocking their heads in your garden while they listen for worms. And they're listening out for the sensitive uh, sort of, you know, the vibrations and the movements of the worms just under the surface. Now, of course, worms are actually very muscular. They're packed with bundles of muscles. They have these tiny backward pointing legs uh, called chaiti. And that actually makes them quite hard to pull out. So sometimes it seems like you might need, you know, a whole gang of birds to pull a, pull a worm out. It can be quite fascinating to watch. Now, you would think with all these predators eating earthworms, uh, there wouldn't be any earthworms left. But quite amazingly, an average garden might actually host up to about 100,000 worms. So there are more than enough worms to go around. Now, also, folks, worms, of course, are brought to the surface during rain. So it does mean that a rain dance might prove quite productive, but not that kind of rain dance. This kind of rain dance. Now, this is the kind of rain dance you're talking. I absolutely love watching gulls uh, while they're hunting for worms. I already think gulls are just absolutely fascinating, like so, so intriguing. Uh, but watching a herring gull in this case uh, dancing for worms is just absolutely magical. Brilliant. And of course, that does mimic the rain uh, on the ground and it brings the worms up. Fantastic. Okay, folks, well, what about at night? Because obviously, you know, part of the hidden world in your garden uh, certainly is happening at night. Uh, and it really can be an exciting introduction to a very alien world. Now, I should say that most animals, and particular birds, you know, they make a bit of a song and dance about going to sleep. And you may often hear this sound, for example. <laughs> very familiar sound at dusk folks and that is of course the chinking call of the blackbird which is easily one of the most agitated birds uh, they just get so anxious about everything they really do now you might hear those calls actually rocketing into a little crescendo like this so that is also uh, that's also blackbird uh, and of course you might also hear this uh, at uh, dawn and dusk A very easygoing, jovial song uh, of a, a bird that sings quite regularly, uh, certainly, um, you know, in the hours of darkness as well. 
And it is, of course, the Robin. Of course, it's the Robin, that very kind of easygoing song. Uh, it's a bit like a kind of gently babbling stream, I suppose. And you might also hear this. So a real proclaiming song there, and that of course comes from the song thrush. So a few things to listen out for, uh, particularly at dawn and dusk. <laughs> Now you might hear that as well and those sounds actually come from the grey squirrel uh, obviously as i said there's a lot of bickering a lot of bickering uh, they're very excitable and they tend to make some great sounds and i always think actually when squirrels are calling like that uh, they sound a bit like an old car that won't start they always sound to me like a like the, the sound of a starter motor that can't quite get going so uh, yeah great things to listen out for so what about at night though because really it's when full darkness ensues uh, that you know the chorus gets really really crazy and it might even resemble uh, but it might resemble something more like a horror film to be honest so have a listen out for this and also this Of course, now I'm sure you all know that that is a tawny owl. And if you combine those calls together, what do you get? There you go, folks. To wit, to woo, to wit, to woo. So that, of course, uh, is the female and the male tawny owl uh, in conversation, talking to each other. So the female call first and the male call second. Now, I should say, actually, that both sexes of tawny owl are capable uh, of uttering the call of the other bird. Uh, but they're not very good at it. They're not very good at it, to be honest. Now, I did promise you some uh, some other vocalizations a little bit earlier in the presentation, and here they are. And this one. Now, of course, that call is so disturbing that I've no doubt uh, that many, many times uh, it's resulted in the police being called, to be honest with you, because it really does sound like somebody being murdered, doesn't it? Uh, but it is, in fact, uh, the, the cause of the, uh, the red fox, uh, the sort of barking call of the dog uh, and the screams of the vixen. Now, if you happen to live somewhere a bit more sort of rural, a bit more countryfied, maybe fringing some woodland, uh, you might actually hear this. <laughs> that is absolutely phenomenal isn't it incredible and that actually is the barking of the roe deer uh, quite an amazing thing to hear that is also quite freaky i think you'd all agree okay folks so we're going to have a little a little quick roundup of just some things to look out for in winter uh, just before we move on into spring uh, now, what I would say is that amphibians, are, apologies if you uh, if you have a filioophobia, I really should have warned you that there was a snake turning up on the screen there. Uh, but, you know, amphibians are reptiles, they don't hibernate, uh, you know, they don't have the ability to regulate their body temperature. So they essentially just remain in a, in a state of torpor over winter. So this means, you know, you might find a, a slow worm uh, or a toad or, you know, possibly even a grass snake, you know, in a compost heap or under larger stones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas frogs tend to uh, overwinter at the bottom of ponds in the mud. Now, many invertebrates, rather surprisingly, actually remain very, very, I really should have warned you if there's any arachnophobes. I'm doing a terrible job here uh, for snakes and spiders, folks. Sorry about this. Um, but many invertebrates remain very, very active. So you'll find that worms and centipedes and ants and wolf spiders, you know, they're all very active through the winter. So many invertebrates uh, have glycerol or other compounds in their tissues, uh, which essentially act as a type of antifreeze. Now, a lot of insects, of course, survive, uh, you know, the harshness of winter by remaining in their juvenile form. 
So a lot of butterflies and moths, for example, they overwinter either as eggs, uh, as larvae, uh, as caterpillars, uh, or in pupal form, like in the case of this orange tip pupa here. Now, of course, though flowers are generally quite sparse in winter, uh, you know, with the kind of warming of our winters as a whole, uh, it means that actually some bee colonies remain open. So in fact, some bufftail bee colonies in the south, uh, they, these colonies actually, they keep on going uh, all the way through the winter. And of course, there's not many sources of nectar at that time of the year. Uh, so what you will tend to find is that garden specialities like Mahonia often tend to support these bufftail bumblebees. Now, of course, warmer weather often rouses overwintering butterflies from their slumber. So you'll find that species that overwinter as adults, like the peacock and the brimstone, you might see them out on really sunny days, desperately looking for nectar. Now, of course, though they're maligned by a lot of people, uh, the kind of popular garden trees, cypress trees, things like, uh, you know, Leyland and Lawson cypress, uh, they're actually really, really popular for roosting birds, especially finches. Now, I can't promise you folks that if you do have a lot of Leyland or Lawson Cypress that you're going to have any hawfinches, uh, to be honest with you, because their distribution is quite patchy. Uh, but you never know. You never know. It's worth a shot. It's worth a look. Uh, they do also like you as well. So it's always worth looking amongst you. Now, you should, of course, look out for any birds that are maximising supplies of winter berries. You know, of course, ivy provides berries very, very late into the season uh, when a lot of other kind of berry bearing trees are completely over. Now, mistletoe, of course, has a connection to a certain species, the mistle thrush, which is named, uh, which is so named because of it. Uh, and mistle thrushes will often vigorously defend uh, a mistletoe territory. Now, of course, the bark of trees also offers a superb little microcline. It can hold a whole host of invertebrates. And of course, that makes it the prime place for birds like this tree creeper uh, to go hunting. Now, I should also say that birdsong really ramps up in late winter. In fact, in the last week, I've noticed an awful lot of, uh, you know, sort of territorial bird singing and calling. Uh, it really does sound like a battleground out there at the moment. Of course, there's a lot of birds and there's very limited hotel space. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, these birds are desperately trying to win a territory. Uh, and if they don't do that, you know, not only might it mean that they can't mate, uh, it may mean that they won't survive because they just don't have a territory to feed within. Now, of course, when we're all tucked up in bed, uh, you know, winter offers you the perfect opportunity to see what happened uh, while you were asleep. So actually, if it snowed, you might come down in the morning and find a badger has been in your garden or a fox has been in your garden or a roe deer. You know, you can look out for sort of pine cones and nuts and even look at the nibble marks on them to see what's been eating them. Now, you might even find a carcass in your garden. If you find a lot of feathers uh, and it looks like they've all been plucked quite neatly, uh, then basically that's a sparrowhawk kill. If, however, the feathers have been snapped, then uh, what's happened is it's actually a fox that's done that because foxes, of course, crunch the feathers and all. Uh, if you do find a mammal carcass as well, it's also more than likely to be a fox. Okay, folks, so moving into spring now, we've left the, uh, the cold depths of winter uh, and we're moving into spring. And of course, the mood in spring is rapidly changing. It's getting very, very busy. Uh, you know, nest building is in full swing. Insects are foraging. Amphibians and reptiles are spawning and mammals are busy suckling young. Now, of course, while a lot of the visible winter wildlife related to the birds, you know, the garden is now really alive with their song. Uh, and, you know, insects are flitting tirelessly, th tirelessly throughout the sunshine hours. Uh, of course, the huge range of seasonal wildflowers are now bursting into bloom and all of the garden animals are looking to exploit, you know, the most favourable breeding conditions of these, uh, you know, lengthening warmer days. Uh, you know, late spring really is the, the height of vibrance and colourful excess. Uh, and I, I'm sure you'd all agree with me that it's definitely, I mean, it's probably the most fantastic season. It's absolutely brilliant, isn't it? It really is. OK, folks, so we're going to do a little spotlight on bumblebees first. Uh, now, bumblebees, you know, early spring is a time of really kind of intense preparation for these, uh, these little workaholics. Uh, and you might see the bufftail bumblebee out rather early. That's certainly, well, typically the most uh, early emerging species. Now, over winter, of course, they've been tucked safely away, often in a small hole in the ground. You might also see the early bumblebee. Uh, it's obviously rather appropriately named that one. Uh, and they're a great sign of spring because they're usually the first insect to emerge in any great numbers. Now, they tend to be followed by the white-tailed bumblebees as well. 
And it's worth saying that all of these early spring emergence, they're all queens. So all of the other inhabitants of last year's colony, uh, they've all perished. It's only the queens that remain. A uh, red-tailed bumblebee here as well. Now, of course, it's the queen's job to form a new colony, but you know she's gonna need to feed really intensively to replenish all that kind of lost fat over the winter. Now they do nest in really warm sheltered places, but it's not always easy for them to find. Uh, so actually, if you see one flying very, very close to the ground, uh, or even walking along the ground, then essentially what it's doing is it's house hunting. It's a bee house hunting, folks. That's what it's doing. Now, bumblebees, of course, they really are marvels of flight. I mean, if you look at them, they're very, very ungainly. You know, they're large and they've got quite small wings. And, you know, it just doesn't seem like they would be able to fly, to be honest with you. Uh, and the reason they can is because they rely on the creation of so-called vortices uh, or little mini whirlwinds to keep them airborne. Uh, their flight really is absolutely incredible. Now, having said that, if they had to rely on flying like an aeroplane, uh, they'd actually defy the laws of physics. And that's because they can't, essentially, they don't have the right kind of wings in that low pressure uh, flowing over the top of the wing uh, would allow them to fly. So actually, they kind of fly more in the style of, of more like a World War I plane. You know, there are, I mean, they don't fly like a World War I plane, but they're a bit slow and bumbling, I suppose. Now, also, they have a remarkable ability to actually take their wings out of gear in order to create heat. So essentially what they do is they vibrate their wing muscles very, very rapidly, but they disengage the wings. Uh, and the reason they do that is, is, is to generate as much heat as possible. So essentially it's a form of shivering. And this is really important for bumblebees because any lengthy periods of inactivity uh, means that they get very, very cool. And when that happens, they can't fly. So they need to do this very regularly. Okay, folks, so a little spotlight on migration, but not the kind of migration that uh, you're probably thinking of, because this is migration of the walking kind. Now, amphibians, they have to stick to a really tight spring schedule. They have to make sure that they get their breeding underway, because if they don't, then their tadpoles are often left uh, sort of drying out and dying uh, in small winter pools. Now, although the migrations don't reach the kind of epic distances of birds or insects, you know, they do often involve really, really large numbers. Now, toads in particular are really determined to reach their, uh, their home breeding ponds. Frogs, not so much, not so much. Uh, but there may certainly be a lot of frogs and toads crossing roads. Uh, undoubtedly, kind of warm, humid nights are usually the best time to, uh, to kind of enjoy the spectacle. But I would say make sure you do take care on the roads uh, at this time, because you never know uh, when you might encounter a toad crossing. Now, we're going to have a quick spotlight on hugging. I say hugging, I mean, it, it, technically it's amplexus, but you know, we'll, we'll call it hugging, we'll call it hugging. It's kind of cute. It's cute, but shameless, cute, but shameless. Um, yeah, cute, but shameless. Oh, we shouldn't anthropomorphize, but it's quite cute, isn't it? But I mean, what on earth is actually going on? Well, the reason this is happening is because it's owing to something called external reproduction. And what is external reproduction? Well, essentially it's where, you know, the females, they're, they're a balloon of eggs and they keep on growing throughout the breeding season as well. And it often looks like she might even burst, which is pretty much exactly what happens. Now, of course, when she does, all of the eggs are released in one gelatinous lump, which we know as frog spawn or toad spawn. But this is the very reason why the male needs to be in exactly the right place at the right time. Now, amazingly, amplexus can even last for weeks, folks, which must be horrific, to be honest with you. It must be absolutely horrific. Anyhow, so... Amplexus, of course, relies, uh, you know, on the muscles of the, of, of the male amphibian. Uh, but because of that, it means it can be challenged and it can be broken uh, by, by rivals. So until the eggs are released by the female, the gloves really are off. So in the blue corner on the right, we have a male here grimly holding on to his female frog. And in the red corner on the left, we've got another frog very, very keen uh, to get this male off. Now, if a male does happen to be displaced, then actually a brawl might occur uh, and other frogs you know will desperately try and uh, try and get hold of the female now having said that there can be negotiation and although it's not that common in frogs uh, it's often in toads so for example toads they might actually use their croak uh, to try and ascertain the sort of power of a rival so they'll croak at each other and usually the the, the toad with the with the with the louder the stronger croak uh, will normally be dominant and it saves there being any argy bargy essentially. Now females sometimes actually use this to their own advantage uh, and what I mean by that is they'll actually approach other toads in order to get them to croak 
in order to try and get rid of a male that they don't like, um, which is a fantastic strategy. Absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. So moving on from amphibians to the long-tailed tit, everybody's favourite little fluffy flying lollipop. Uh, it really is a fantastic little bird. Now, funny enough, it's not really a tit at all. It's actually much more closely related to the babblers of Asia and Africa. And it's a very, very social bird. It's a bird with strong family ties. I'm sure you're all familiar that when you see long tail, when you see a long tailed tit, you don't just see one, do you? You always see lots of long tailed tits. They, they, they never really travel around on their own. Now they do also help each other with cooperative breeding. So often siblings of the parent birds will often assist in feeding uh, if their own nests actually fail. So very, very helpful. Now, the one thing that I do want to say about them specifically is they produce one of the most fantastic pieces of architecture, uh, you know, in the bird kingdom, uh, certainly in the UK anyway. They're absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and how do they make this? How do they make this nest? Well, what they do is they use moss and feathers and hair. And I should say, actually, they don't specifically require uh, the hair from a blonde female human. So bear that in mind. Uh, any hair will do. Uh, they also need lichen. They need lots of lichen and they bind it all together with spider silk. And the result of that is this fantastic little nest. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I should say it's also really, really elastic. If you ever find, a, you know, an old long tailed tit nest, the spider silk makes it really, really elasticated. They're absolutely amazing, amazing things. Okay, so what about the mole? Uh, now, the mole surely is the very definition of hidden wildlife. It doesn't really get any more hidden than this, does it, to be honest? Fantastic little thing. I mean, who has even seen a live mole or who's seen a live mole regularly? Um, because I suspect it's not that many people, to be honest. Now, it is our only fossorial, uh, fossorial mammal, and that means that obviously it lives its life underground. And interestingly, within the mole's tunnels, their dimensions correspond almost precisely to their size. Now this can actually cause a bit of a predicament when they're reversing around in their tunnels. So they've, they've got two options essentially everybody, they either reverse uh, or what they do is, uh, if you think of swimmers, uh, like Olympic swimmers and the way they do that little roly-poly thing at the end of their lap to turn around, well that essentially is what moles have to do if they don't want to reverse. So it must be a great thing to see, but obviously um, I don't have any video of, uh, to, to show you that unfortunately. Now of course prey often falls right into the mole's laps, uh, it goes without saying that their tunnel system essentially means that prey often drops right in uh, and they have this super sensitive nose, super sensitive whiskers uh, and, and razor sharp teeth, which, you know, uh, make short work of anything that uh, does happen to come their way. Now, of course, they have these rather large kind of spade like front claws uh, and it means that essentially they, they swim through the soil. Uh, they're able to move a lot of soil very, very quickly. Now, an individual mole's tunnels might actually add up to about 150 metres, which is quite incredible for such a small animal. Uh, generally, inadvertent meetings between moles will normally result in fisticuffs, everybody. Uh, so little boxing matches, um, which may not be quite as jovial as, as, as I've made it appear with these boxing gloves, but nonetheless. OK, everybody. So the old adage says as blind as a, well, it's as blind as a bat, isn't it, everybody? That's, that's what it says. Uh, but truthfully, this is rubbish because bats actually aren't blind at all. They're not, they're not blind. So we can't really say as blind as a, as blind as a bat, can we? So, so, so what about as blind as a mole? Can, can we say as blind as a mole? Um, well, no, we can't really, because moles actually aren't blind either, everybody. Now, I should say that mole eyesight, it's, it's not very good. I mean, they're not blind, but it's not very good. You know, they can just about see light. They've got these tiny little eyes, uh, but very, very strangely, the, their breeding is actually triggered in spring by sunlight as the days start to lengthen. Oh, apologies for that, folks. I just went too far there. But I was about to say, you know, as an animal that lives in the darkness, it's quite amazing that their life cycle is uh, is governed by the sun. Incredible, incredible. So if you truly want to use the adage as blind as an animal, then um, perhaps you could be as blind as an olm, because olms are truly blind. Uh, and this is an aquatic salamander that lives in Europe. So there you go, as blind as an olm, everyone. OK, folks, now I had to cover the dunnock. I absolutely love the dunnock. Uh, it's a very, very underrated bird. It's very much a skulking bird of the understory. You'll often see them scampering around uh, on the ground in your garden, uh, you know, within the hedgerows, underneath the bird feeders. Uh, and it, it's really always been very much underappreciated. You know, it's long suffered the indignity of misnaming. Uh, you know, for an awful long time, it's been known as the hedge sparrow. It's not actually a hedge sparrow. It belongs to a family of birds called the accenters. 
but unfortunately for the Dunnock, even its name loosely translates to dingy brown diminutive, um, which is not very nice for it, is it, to be honest with you? Uh, but, you know, the thing is that we've long held this misunderstanding of the Dunnock, and it has always been considered a bird of few striking attributes. But actually, this was really flipped on its head when we started to look at its breeding habits. I say we, I didn't look at its breeding habits, but some people looked at its breeding habits. Uh, and it truly does have one of the most complex and elaborate mating systems of all British birds. Now, the Dunnock, uh, they, they do engage in monogamy. Uh, obviously, where this is where, you know, a single male and a single female, this does happen. It does happen. Uh, but actually, uh, they're also uh, polygynous. This is very, very common. Uh, where a male may have two or possibly three females. So I suppose you could say really that the Dunnock is a bit like Casanova. It's a bit like Casanova, isn't it? But actually they also indulge, well, they're also polyandrous, they're polyandrous. And this means that a female Dunnock might have maybe two, three or even more mates. So I suppose you could say really that the Dunnock is more like a female version of Casanova. But that's not all everybody because they also engage in polygynandry. And polygynandry uh, is where, where a couple of males might actually be sharing a female. Uh, but actually, then the first male might actually acquire another female. But the second male might acquire another female as well. But then the first male, of course, is always also still being shared by... Look, it doesn't make any sense. I can't explain it. I can't understand it. it, it it's very complicated. Um, but suffice to say, uh, what it means is that it increases the chances of successfully rearing young because more males are roped in to feeding more offspring. Brilliant, what a brilliant bird. So from the mating of Dunnocks to the mating of hedgehogs, something rather different. Uh, so as a comparison, you know, how does hedgehog mating come about? Well, to be honest, folks, this is how it comes about. So step number one, uh, the male approaches a female. Step number two, uh, he snorts in a flirtatious manner. Step number three, she rebuffs him. And then she runs away. He will, however, catch up with her and circle her, at which point uh, she rebuffs him again. Now, he might try this on for a number of hours, which can only really have one conclusion. That's right, she rebuffs him. I'm sure you all saw that coming, right? Certainly a pattern here. Uh, at this point, he might just get bored and wander off. It's quite possible. Uh, other males might turn up and they may or may not be more successful. There's no guarantee. Uh, eventually the female gets so thoroughly sick of it all that she just submits. That is the end result. Uh, and if the male's very lucky, she might flatten her spines to make mating just that little bit easier. Okay, folks, now I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, where can I go to see an enormous plant that smells of rotting flesh? Well, the answer to you is you could go to Sumatra uh, to see the, uh, the giant arum. Uh, the a Titan Arum, the Titan Arum, which is a plant that David Attenborough has been uh, filled with in, on many occasions over the years. Now, you could also go to Borneo to see the rather stinky Rafflesia, uh, a flower that I have been lucky enough to see myself. Now, I should also say that the scale of the Rafflesia is quite deceptive. Uh, so this is actually a plant that uh, totals more than one metre. Now, I say this is what you're all thinking, but you probably weren't thinking any of this at all. Now, we don't actually have any giant stinking plants, uh, but we do have a stinking plant. And that plant is the Lords and Ladies. Now, the Lords and Ladies has a staggering variety of vernacular, uh, actually more than 100 names in total. Now, many of them are really, really suggestive, um, as if Lords and Ladies isn't enough. Uh, so we're probably not going to go into any more of those today. Now, we've already had the breeding strategy of hedgehogs. So I thought what we'd do is we'd have a step by step guide uh, to luring insects uh, if you're a Lords and Ladies, an Arum maculatum. So in mid-spring, you should extend your fleshy leaf-like hood, uh, which you can see in the pictures on the top left and the bottom right, known as a spathe from the ground. Now you should then unfurl it to reveal this uh, little poker-shaped inflorescence, uh, which is known as a spadix. So you can see that in those two pictures. Now what you should do is you should hide your true flowers from view right down at the bottom of the spadix. But you should then emit a really, really pungent smell uh, in order to try and attract some insects, uh, in particular midges. Now, the spadix will actually raise the ambient temperature, and fortunately, that will actually create an even more fetid smell uh, as the chemical mix becomes more volatile. Now, you should then imprison all the midges below a backward pointing ring of hairs uh, that are actually derived from your, from your sterile male flowers. 
However, they do get a reward for this. So actually you should reward them with a secretion uh, from your seed bearing female flowers. Now with a bit of luck, they'll already have visited another Aram maculatum and you'll be pollinated. Uh, and at that point, what you can do is you can rain pollen down upon them uh, and release them, probably. Okay, folks, what about a spotlight on the hungry caterpillar? Actually, I've changed my mind. We're going to do a spotlight on the hungry blue tit, which kind of loosely relates to the caterpillar. So the blue tit, fantastic little bird. You know, come mid-spring, blue tits, essentially, you would not expect to see them on your garden feeders. And that's because they've got a completely different mission. You know, leaf buds are opening to reveal caterpillars. Uh, you know, they're desperately looking for caterpillars for their young. Now, their breeding season is timed really precisely to coincide with the caterpillar peak. Uh, it's a real knife edge. You know, there's only a couple of weeks uh, either way uh, that potentially could be catastrophic. Now, tits really do put all of their eggs in one basket, uh, literally, and that is because they have really, really large brood sizes. So actually a blue tit might have more than 10 hungry males to feed. Now, although typically for smaller broods, blue tits will have to capture, you know, a few hundred caterpillars a day, sometimes they might require up to a thousand caterpillars a day, which just seems an absolutely staggering statistic. Now, you're probably thinking, how on earth do caterpillars even survive this kind of massacre? Well, I should probably tell you that a big oak tree actually hold more, might hold more than half a million caterpillars, uh, and even a kind of less well-endowed tree uh, might have over a thousand caterpillars per vertical square meter. Quite incredible. It just You would never imagine there being that many. Of course, as I said, timing is really, really crucial. You know, should these tits get it wrong, they're in big trouble. Uh, you know, the lives and the fortunes of tits and the caterpillars, they're really interwoven together. Um, now, in spring, for example, if you see tits capturing a lot of other insects as opposed to caterpillars, it's not great news, but it's not terrible. If, however, these tits are taking a lot of food from your garden feeders, it's really not good. Yeah, it goes to show things are very, very bad indeed. Now, you might also be thinking, folks, why do blue tits only capture one caterpillar at a time? Now, of course, a lot of birds, when they're capturing insects, they absolutely stuff as many in their beaks as they possibly can. There's a very, very simple reason for this, folks. It's because caterpillars bite. It's because they bite. Uh, so the blue tits have to make sure uh, that they, they basically whack the heads of the caterpillars uh, on a branch to, uh, well, I say subdue them. I mean, it's probably a little bit more than subdue them, to be honest. Uh, and it's just to make sure that they don't actually bite the young. Um, and that's why, that's why they only carry one at a time. It just makes it a lot easier. Okay, folks, so a little spotlight on cloning. Now, you're probably thinking, what on earth am I talking about when I talk about cloning? Well, I'm talking about these, I'm talking about aphids. Uh, so whereas many insects might incorrectly be termed as bugs, aphids actually belong to the true bugs, the hemiptera. Uh, now, they really are a case of girl power. And the reason I say that is because their population is totally dominated by females. Now, in order to build their vast numbers, uh, I'm sure any of you who garden, which I'm sure is most of you, uh, I don't really need to tell you that, do I? The aphid numbers are going to be uh, really quite explosive. Uh, but they use a system known as parthenogenesis. So essentially, females are giving birth to females. Uh, this is virgin birth. So they're all clones. They're all clones, everybody. And this parthenogenesis means that you get an awful lot of aphids very, very quickly. Now, what about the guys? What about the men? Where are the male aphids? Well, later on in the season, you know, changing weather, it eventually does trigger production uh, of both the males and also some specific females used for egg laying. So the, the males, they, they do come eventually, um, but they're just not around for long and they only have a very, very brief role, essentially. OK, folks, so moving from aphids uh, onto a real aphid predator, the ladybird. Now, the ladybirds, they undertake a four stage process of radical form change. Uh, known as complete metamorphosis. So you can see that here from the egg to the larva to the pupa to the adult back to well not back to eggs again but you see what I mean and of course it raises that age-old question of you know chicken egg what came first scenario but anyway we'll leave that for now. Uh, this complete metamorphosis you know it's shared by a lot of other invertebrates uh, butterflies and moths uh, you know hymenoptera the uh, the ants wasps and bees beetles, scorpion flies, all of the true flies, the diptera, for example. Now, the other kind of form of metamorphosis is known as incomplete or partial metamorphosis. And this is where the young actually look like miniaturized versions of the adults, uh, nymphs. Now, 
Uh, moving on to a section I like to call terror in the trees or terror in the vegetation, I probably should have called it. And that's because of the ladybird larva. The ladybird larva are without doubt one of the most voracious predators in your garden. I absolutely love watching these things. Now I have to say when I was a kid, uh, I used to spend hours just watching ladybird larva feasting on aphids. Uh, and I'm fairly sure that I used to move them around um, to other little aphid populations so I could watch them continue to eat. Uh, they always absolutely fascinated me. And I have to say, they, they're a bit dinosaur-like, aren't they? They really remind me of, of like an ankylosaur, to be honest. They're like a little, uh, little armored warrior, quite fantastic. But of course they had the voracious appetite of a T-Rex, uh, which is actually rather different from an ankylosaur, of course. Now you can also find uh, something else in your garden, which looks a bit like an ankylosaur, and that is the, uh, the caterpillar of the peacock butterfly, uh, this fantastically spiky thing. Um, but of course, they're not, uh, they're not feasting uh, on live prey. Uh, they're actually consuming vegetable matter or vegetative matter, which is usually stinging nettles in the case of uh, the peacock butterfly. Right, so if you wanted to see an awesome uh, sort of water-based ambush predator, then you might look towards something like the great white shark or you know, the tasseled wobbegong or the frogfish. The frogfish is a great ambush predator. Or on land, you know, lots of snake species, species like the puff adder are fantastic ambush predators. But we have our own water-based ambush predators uh, and they generally exist in your pond, even if you've got a tiny, tiny little pond. Now, it really is a case of eat or be eaten in the pond. It is a very, very dangerous place to be. In fact, it makes you wonder how most things even survive in there, to be honest with you. Now, many of the kind of horrors that lurk in your garden pond, they're actually bugs, just like the aphids. Uh, so they belong to the order Hemiptera once again. Now, one of them is the pond skater. Uh, and I suppose if you were to adopt a kind of skating analogy, uh, then the pond skater is a little bit less Torval and Dean uh, and a little bit more Tonya Harding. Uh, some of you might have to look that up, but I have no idea, but there we go. Uh, and it's a vicious little thing, you know, it prowls around, uh, basically, you know, um, eviscerating any other sort of trapped insects that it finds, uh, you know, sort of floating along on the surface tension of the water. Uh, and, you know, using its mouth parts to pierce its prey and, and suck them dry. So, you know, they're quite, quite a predator. Now, there is, of course, also the water boatman. Uh, you can see those fantastically long legs that look just like oars. So you can really see where they get the name from. Now, of course, because they swim around on their backs, uh, it means that their piercing mouth parts are always pointing upwards. So they're always ready to impale any potential prey. Um, yeah, so that, they're, they're just amazing, aren't they? Fantastic. Now, I would say you should probably avoid, uh, you know, putting your fingers too close to water boat, boatmen because they can actually give you a really painful little nip. Now, there's also the water scorpion, uh, which does look very much like a terrestrial scorpion. But yet again, it is another bug. Now, they have these hugely pumped up forearms that actually look like big kind of bicep uh, loaded arms, don't they? And of course, they use this to capture their prey. Uh, and then the mouth parts usually make quite short work. Now, alongside these bugs, there are other predators in your pond, you know, the great diving beetles. Uh, they have a habit of just annihilating pretty much everything within a small water body. But undoubtedly, the greatest ambush predators for me are those of the dragonfly larvae. These things are unbelievably voracious predators. They will just eat absolutely everything. They're incredible. Uh, and they actually have a, an anatomical sort of device to help them out with this. And it's what's known as a prehensile labium. And this is actually where they can eject this lower jaw uh, in order to catch prey. And actually this is such a fast mechanism um, that should they miss prey on the first occasion, sometimes they actually get an opportunity to do it a couple of times before the prey is even noticed. Uh, so they really are a true terror of the pond. Now, from terror of the pond to terror in the sky, because of course, when dragonflies actually uh, change from their juvenile, their larval stages to adults, uh, they essentially change from hitmen of the garden pond uh, to assassin of the skies. Uh, the adult dragonflies, they just continue their domination, but within a new environment. Um, they're unbelievably agile and they've got almost endless stamina. So they really are one of the most incredible flying creatures on the planet. Now they have these huge flight muscles within the thorax that actually control their wings independently. So it gives them really, really exquisite control. Uh, and it means essentially they can comp propel themselves in any direction. So this makes them very much the attack helicopter of the sky. 
Now the top speed of some species actually works out to be sort of 10 to 15 meters a second. Uh, this is more than 100 body lengths per second in forward flight, which is really, really explosive acceleration. Now, actually, their, their kind of phenomenal powers of flight have, have already actually paved the development of aircraft. Uh, they've inspired a lot of drone technology and even advances in space exploration as well. Now, of course, they feast on a huge range of prey, uh, smaller species such as midges and mosquitoes, in the case of the smaller dragonflies and damselflies, uh, you know, butterflies and moths. Uh, and in the cases of the larger species of dragonflies, they'll even eat each other. Uh, and the dragonflies will certainly eat the damselflies. Okay, folks, well, something completely different. Our, our, last, uh, our last mating section uh, of the presentation actually relates to mating of mollusks or love in the slow lane, as I like to call it. Uh, and we're gonna concentrate on the snail for this one. Uh, so snails are hermaphrodites. They carry the organs of both sexes within their body. Uh, so therefore every snail that a snail encounters is a suitable mate. A couple of snails mating here for you, everybody. Now, when you're as slow as a snail, it really is quite important uh, that you maximize all opportunities. If, however, you think that snails lack passion, everybody, you are sorely mistaken. So let's just go for a little quick guide on snail mating. Now, step number one, uh, of course, is to bump into a suitable partner, which essentially is any snail you meet. Step number two, you will almost certainly become overwhelmed with lust. Uh, step number three, uh, usually some gentle, uh, sorry, some gentle tentacle touching is called for. Step number four, uh, to rear up on your soul for a little bit of kissing, a little bit of mouth to mouth contact, surprisingly. Step number five, nah, not such a nice one. Uh, you should release copious amounts of mucus to avoid any unnecessary friction. Sorry, folks. I mean, that's what happens. Uh, step number six, you lie side by side to make copulation possible. Step number seven, well, I mean, it's going to take a while, isn't it? It's going to take a while. Everything is very slow, as I said. Now, step number eight, when genital contact is made, uh, you should actually fire something known as a love dart into the other snail. And now this is something that's made from proteins and calcium carbonate. It, it might sting, uh, but you don't want to miss, because if you do miss, you all you'll do is you'll slow the process down even further. Now, when you're engaged, uh, packets of sperm essentially are transferred from one snail to another. This might go on for quite a while. You should then copulate for as many hours as is possible and then continue on your way. And I should say that step number 14 uh, is you should repeat steps number one to 12 uh, as often as possible with every snail you encounter, uh, which means it may be a very long night. OK, folks, war from love to war. Uh, now, of course, we think of the lion as being of the king of the jungle. Well, in fact, that's not entirely true. Uh, we don't think of the lion as being the king of the jungle because actually they don't live in the jungle, as you all know. Uh, there might be some Asiatic lions that are living in kind of Indian forests, but essentially the lion isn't the king of the jungle. But from the lion, uh, we move to this ferocious, frenzied, bloodthirsty little killer, uh, which of course is the common true, which you may well find in your garden. Now, in terms of its voracious nature, uh, really the, the shrew is king. The lion is not king. The shrew is king in terms of its ferociousness. It is unbelievable. Now the common true, I mean it's the second most numerous mammal after the short-tailed field vole. Uh, they do have very very poor eyesight, they've got these tiny little eyes, but they have quite an acute sense of smell and very very sensitive whiskers uh, known as vibrissae. Now they also retain something known as a cloaca which is a single outlet for digestive, reproductive and urinary tracts and this is something actually that separates them from all the rest of the placental mammals. So it actually makes them more closely related, uh, for example, to birds, reptiles and fish. Now, they really are a fizzing ball of unstoppable energy uh, and their hearts might beat up to a thousand beats per minute, quite incredibly. They have this supercharged metabolism, uh, which helps them to stay warm. And they tend to take only the briefest of naps throughout the day and night. Now, they are in almost perpetual motion. Um, and they must feed every two to three hours throughout the day and night, eating their own body weight every day. And of course, this is what makes them such a voracious, fearsome predator. They will violently rip their way through spiders, insects, worms, slugs, snails, anything they can get hold of. It really is. Uh, it, I mean, it's a killing spree, folks. It is actually a killing spree. Now the shrews actually, they can even emit ultrasound and this ultrasound might be used, uh, you know, for mating and fighting and, and even in the manner of bats for, uh, for kind of, you know, mapping out the, uh, the habitats that they live within. 
And often you will actually hear the very high pitched shrieks uh, of shrews in the undergrowth. Okay, folks, so a very quick section on obligate brood parasites. What is an obligate brood parasite? Well, it's a cuckoo, but you're all thinking, well, I'm not gonna see a cuckoo in my garden, am I, anymore? And you're absolutely right. You're not gonna see a cuckoo in your garden, but what you might see is a cuckoo bee. So these are the cuckoos that you're still likely to see. Now they don't look or sound like the traditional cuckoo, but they do share the same sneaky uh, habits in their lifestyle. Now they strike very, very early in the nesting season. You know, they emerge from their hibernation just a few weeks after their hosts. And what they do is they select a bumblebee colony and they'll actually mingle with the freshly hatched uh, bumblebee workers um, and they quickly become covered in the, in, the, in the chemicals that actually cover all the workers. So of course this gives them the perfect disguise. So this means that they're ready to take over the colony. Now generally they're larger than their host bumblebee species uh, and this is really really important because they actually they have to neutralize the existing queen which is not so great for her. Uh, this actually is not always that unusual because uh, bumblebee queens will often force takeovers um, if they haven't been able to rear their own colony. Now the cuckoo bee, once it's killed the existing queen, uh, it actually then adopts all the workers and of course it feasts upon all the food uh, that is brought to, brought to her. So she'll then lay her own eggs uh, and she'll allow the workers to raise, uh, to raise her, her eggs, her young. And of course that means the only survivors from this colony uh, will be her offspring. Now you might be thinking, well how on earth am I going to recognise a cuckoo bee from its host bumblebee species. And you're right to ask that because unfortunately they look very, very similar to their hosts. But there are a few things you can look out for uh, as a general rule. Cuckoo bees tend to have very, very dark wings. Uh, they also tend to be much less densely haired. So you tend to see a much more shininess uh, on the abdomen and the thorax as a result. And they also don't have any pollen baskets. Of course, they don't collect pollen. They have no need to do this because they're kleptoparasites. So they have no pollen baskets on the hind legs. Okay, folks, so I promised you a zebra in this presentation. Uh, so essentially that's what I'm gonna finish off on. And of course it isn't actually a zebra. Uh, it's the very, very fantastic zebra spider. I absolutely love this thing. Ah, oh, it's just beautiful, it's just beautiful. And it really is the true representation of itsy bitsy little spider. So this is a tiny little thing, just five to sort of nine millimeters in size. Uh, so you really do have to get very, very close, uh, usually with a macro lens to get any reasonable photos of this spider. Now, their scientific name actually of Salticus Senecus, uh, it loosely translates to dancing decorative. I'm not really gonna talk about their, their sort of dancing mating strategy today, um, A, because I don't really have time and well, just because of that really. Uh, so they belong to a huge family of jumping spiders around about sort of 6,000 jumping spiders across the world. And they're really captivating to watch. So even if you have arachnophobia and you don't like spiders, I promise you this spider is very, very different because they don't have typical spider-like movements. They have rather kind of jerky cat-like movements. Uh, there's something quite adorable about them. So you really must get out there and, uh, and keep your eyes peeled for them. Now, they really are masters of hunting. Uh, of course, they have these four pairs of eyes helping them to stalk a suitable victim. Now, what they tend to do is they tend to anchor themselves with a, with a silken thread and then essentially they sneak to within striking distance and then they pounce right upon their prey, quickly injecting it with venom uh, and therefore subduing it very, very rapidly. Now, you might be looking at those legs and think, well, how do they even manage to, you know, to jump? Because they don't have particularly big legs. And that's very, very true. They don't have muscled legs. But what they do is they have this incredible method of being able to control their bodily fluid, which is known as hemolymph. And what they do is they force fluid very, very quickly uh, into the legs. And it's this rapid extension uh, that actually powers the jump, that can see them jump more than 10 times their own body length, uh, which I'm sure you'll all, do, all agree is, uh, if you extrapolate that to human terms, would be, uh, would be quite impressive, quite impressive. So unfortunately, I don't have a video of, uh, of a, a zebra spider actually uh, jumping onto its prey, because again, that exceeds my videography skills. Uh, but I do have a little video of some prey that this uh, zebra spider has already caught. Little fly here. There you go. Little zebra spider video for you folks. Okay, so a quick roundup of spring, just very, very quickly, we'll rattle through this. Now in spring, I should say, uh, you know, listen out for departing winter visitors as well. So red wing, you know, they migrate back to their sort of uh, breeding grounds in Scandinavia by night. So actually, if you, even if you live in an urban area, you often might hear their flight call. 
And this is what it sounds like. So have a listen out for this. There you go, folks. Very thin, very high pitched, a high pitched seep. Okay. So of course, bats start to become very, very active in early spring. You know, their fat reserves have become really, really low over winter through hibernation. So it's definitely worth looking out for pipistrels uh, around your house at, at dusk. Uh, March generally sees the arrival of, uh, you know, many of our summer migrant birds. So the chiff chaff is usually first to arrive and it'll be swiftly followed by birds like black cap and swallow and many, many, many others. Now I should say that bear in mind, we do have uh, chiff chaffs and black caps that overwinter in the UK as well now. Uh, so you may well see them uh, earlier than this period. Now, although gray squirrel drays actually might appear quite quiet, March is the peak time for young squirrels uh, being born. And, and you, you, you might find if you're really lucky, you know, not so lucky for the squirrel, but if a squirrel dray happens to get disturbed, then you might actually spot a mother moving her babies, which is uh, quite, quite a great thing to see. Now, you should also keep an eye out under your garden shed. You know, many fox litters actually occupy this space underneath the shed. Um, and they can squeeze through really, really tiny openings. So they're really kind of exploit exploiting the warmth uh, that is very uh, typical near human habitats. Now, if you happen to check in your garden pond, you might see newts undertaking this really, really flashy kind of courtship ritual. Now, I should say that in spring, all three of the newt species, so this is the smooth newt, uh, this one here, the palmate newt, uh, and the great crested newt, they all have these lovely orangey undersides. Uh, spring, of course, is a time for really hot tempered, uh, you know, male butterflies and actually male butterflies. They spend more time looking to mate uh, than to feed. So they really are quite single minded. Um, and it's well worth looking out for one of the very first signs of a uh, proper spring, uh, which is the orange tip butterfly. Now, if you're lucky enough to spot a hedgehog, you might actually witness some really weird behavior. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a photo of it, but it's known as self anointing. Uh, and obviously, well, often this comes with a, with a foaming mouth. Uh, so they might look rabid, but I promise you they're not. Uh, they'll get into really contorted positions and then essentially they'll toss spit over themselves, which doesn't sound particularly nice, does it? But, uh, you know, there could be any number of reasons for why they do this. It might be to, you know, um, mask their kind of typical scent or to make their scent even more powerful or to, you know, help with parasites. There's all number of different reasons. Uh, and I don't think anybody's really been able to definitively agree uh, on what the, uh, the actual proper reason is. Now, of course, you should also look and listen out for uh, later arriving migrant birds uh, at the end of spring. Things like screaming squiffs, of course, and, you know, you might be lucky enough to get spotted flycatchers in your garden. Now, for me, the screaming swifts were always just a bird that they just remind me of my childhood. I absolutely loved them. And I'm sure for many of you, uh, the sound of the swifts in late spring uh, and summer, and of course, something that's sadly declining, very sadly declining, uh, is just absolutely fantastic, just beautiful. Now, of course, uh, following on from Michael's fantastic presentation last week uh, on moths, if you do have a moth trap, make sure you put it out. And if you don't have a moth trap, then um, buy one or, or make one, uh, because it will just open it, open things up, well, it'll open you up to a fantastic new world of wonder, because the kingdom of the moths is absolutely phenomenal. It's just incredible. OK, folks, well, there we have it. So that's a, a sort of cursory foray into the uh, the really weird, but kind of mind-bogglingly wonderful world within your garden. Um, I obviously haven't covered everything. I've probably covered far too much. Uh, please don't write any letters of complaint about all the things I missed because there will be thousands. Um, and what I would say is, you know, we absolutely depend on our member support to help us throughout Sussex. Uh, you know, so please do join us, uh, you know, join in, become a member so we can protect uh, our natural heritage for the future. And what I would also like to say as well is that bear in mind, Charlotte has written lots of incredible uh, content about helping garden wildlife. Um, so please do get on the site and make sure you check some of that material out. So just a quick slide as well to, uh, to say thank you to all the photographers who, uh, who basically uh, unknowingly uh, provided images for my presentation. So, uh, so thank you all very much. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody. That's all. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and apologies that I've gone on for uh, quite so long. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, rest assured, they absolutely did enjoy it. We've, we've had the Q&A absolutely full of wonderful feedback saying how, how brilliant it is. People have been entertained and educated. Um, <laughs> Favourite comment is probably, it's like horrible histories. 
<laughs> wonders. So, so there you go. Brilliant. Um, I've been busily typing away to answer some of the questions behind the scenes. If you've got any energy left in you, there is time to um, answer uh, maybe two or three questions um, before we wrap up for the evening. Yeah, no, um, I'll certainly probably. All right. So the first, the first most pressing question: Will you be doing summer and autumn at some point? <laughs> Oh, God, you know, my my original plan for this presentation, of course, was to do all four seasons. And uh, after an awful long time, I got about halfway through winter um, and I thought that's not going to happen. Four seasons is not going to happen. In fact, two seasons at that point seemed a little bit unachievable. Uh, summer and autumn will be happening, uh, but I didn't think there was any point doing them now uh, because obviously we're miles away from it and we're still really stuck in winter aren't we for another uh, month yeah. so yes I will be doing them uh, and keep your eyes peeled in summer <laughs> something to look forward to that, that'll please people yeah. um so a question from uh, Nick Nick Redmond is it too late to put up a bird box um no 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 in in, in no in a word it's not no you can definitely still put up a bird box I mean birds at the moment obviously they're, they're there's a lot of territorial activity in terms of setting up a territory, but birds actually are very, very quick to cotton on to new things entering their territory. Um, so yeah, you can definitely put up a new bird box, no problem at all. Yeah, absolutely, I totally agree. Um, so there's a question from Mike Dixon, which is more of a general one. If you want to see bats, what's the best place to kind of go and look for bats and when is the best time to do that? Well, do you know, that's a frustration. Normally I would say, well, the best thing to do is to come on a Sussex Wildlife Trust public bat walk um but I, I you know i can't really suggest that can i yeah. now it, it i mean it's a funny one because i would say that my previous house i used to just be able to step outside the back door uh, and there would often be pipistrelles just whizzing around outside outside the door at dusk uh, so technically you don't really need to go anywhere to see bats uh, but what i would really strongly recommend uh, if you're able to is to buy yourself a bat detector uh, even if it's one of the very very basic ones because it really will uh, it will open up a new world and you'll realise just how many bats there are uh, living in really close proximity to you. So, you you know, to be honest, Mike, you don't really need to go anywhere. Uh, but obviously there are some reserves, for example, which have a much wider variety of bat species. But, you know, you can't really go there within the limits of daily exercise. So, yeah, just uh, if you can get yourself a bat detector, get yourselves on eBay, everybody. eBay for bat detectors. There we go. I second that one. Brilliant. Well, I think that's probably more than enough for you to cope with in one evening, James. You probably need to sit down and have a bit of a rest now. So just to say thank you again. Um, if there are any outstanding questions, we will get to them all. Um, we might pop up a blog on the website just to provide the answers to, to anything else that people have been asking. And thank you so much for asking those questions as well.